and myself. Hello, guys. Uh, hello, YouTube. Dave here with Kevin Schoonover. Let me add, I'm going to add another account. I apologize for getting going. Doing my server work with. Oh, hang on. Phone is buzzing off the wall. Something's buzzing. I don't know. Jesus. Join. Please join. Stop everything from buzzing. So if you've got this on, if you started this on YouTube, what we're going to do is uh, mute that. And, man, I need, to throw a, I need to throw a disclaimer out there every time I do a YouTube uh, on a home server show because guys read the title and they expect like a five-minute YouTube video to tell them everything about the topic that they want to hear about. And that's not necessarily what happens on this podcast. Remember that this is a podcast, and we take an hour to go over highlights, right? So we go over highlights of some items, and then we push you into the homeservershow.com forums where the meat lays. And you can go in there and you can gnaw the meat off all you want. Right here, we're just kind of, we're just kind of finger foods. So, it's a podcast. Remember that. It's a podcast. I get flamed every week, Kevin. Every week. <laughs> Mostly for old videos. Especially my um, my PF Sense. My router is better than your router video. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People click that and they're like, PF Sense is not running on Linux. Dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> Bill thumbs down it. You, you ignorant slut. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just it's a podcast, you know. We kind of just we kind of blanket coverage. <laughs> if, if you want to know something about these products we're talking about, HomeServerShow.com. Click the forums link. There's a forum for building servers, testing servers, adding on to servers. You name it, these guys are doing it. You want to be in that forum. So I need to say that, Kevin, every time we go live, before before I start the audio recording, this is a podcast, just forward. If you're watching on YouTube, just go forward. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I hear you. <laughs> what... Um, So I've got 277. Is that what I'm on? 277. I think so. I've got a little bit of show notes, but it's not very much, Kevin. You'll be able to keep up, and then we'll just okay. jump right into the 240. Sounds good. And I need to get that link. 140. 140. Did I, did I, did I, I didn't print 240, did I? No. Nope. I hope to God I didn't. I think you got 140 up there. Okay, I did. Why did I say 240? I'm thinking 277. 140, 240, whatever it takes. Yes, 140. Maybe that's the new version, and we're just prognosticating. My audio, okay? It's perfect. Good. It is muy bueno. Let me capture. Test, test. Then let's I guess keep this here. Somebody wants to see my profile at the bottom. No. Let's do that. But then it's gonna say Surface Geeks, isn't it? Oh what the hell? Yeah, it's got the uh, Surface Geek logo. It's just a podcast. People can get over it, right? you you would hope. Mm -hmm. How's our chat room? Chat chat room's chatting. Good job. It's chatterific. Hello, chat room. HSS Dave. So I can talk to him. Hey, guys. 
All right, here we go. This is the Home Server Show, episode number 277, recorded on February the 18th, 2015. It's the TS-140. It's a Lenovo, Lenovo server. We're going to be tearing that thing apart with my guest, Mr. Kevin Schoonover. Welcome to the Home Server Show, Kevin. Hey, glad to be back. It's been a while. It's been a while. It's been a while for Home Server Show. I'm getting nasty tweets. Dave, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Please. And I, to, and I had to go on the top of the show and say, hey, if you're watching on YouTube, remember, this is a podcast. So I kind of went off. So you can go watch the video and, and check that out. But Well, and, and the Home Server Show is well known. Okay, Ubi, what do you think about Home Server Show? David McCabe is a great guy, but he is no Jim Collison. Oh, oh you know, she is so opinionated. Gosh, God. she's got such... Attitude. It's just... Attitude. Attitude. Wow. Ubi. Oh, my gosh. I'm not even... I hope my Ubi didn't hear your Ubi, or it's going to be <laughs> bite. But you're right. I am no Jim Collison. And we, so we, uh, we have Jim. He's, he's traveling. I deserve that because I made fun of Jim last uh, podcast with the Ubi. I set him up pretty good. I thought it was a pretty good intro. But uh, <laughs> Hey, uh, follow Home Server Show on Twitter, at Home Server Show. And, uh, of course, don't forget about our world-famous forums, at homeservershow.com slash forums. If you want information about what we're talking about today, you need to get out to the forums. That's where the meat is. We're just kind of giving you an appetizer. This is a podcast. It's an appetizer. You want the meat? Go to the forums. And Schoon Dog, Schoon Doggy, he's um he's a moderator out there, so uh, he's out there quite a bit. But um, don't forget, we are a member of the Geeks Network, thegeeksnetwork.com. Find more fine podcasts like this one, and a whole handful of forums. Is there a podcast in you? And we are not sponsored by Clean Stylist this week, but I've got this really cool sponsor for Surface Geeks. And if you own a Surface Pro 3, you owe it to yourself to go to surfacegeeks.net or .com. Click on the banner ad on the top and go buy one of these. It is the coolest thing ever. I'm really a super duper fan. I've pulled it off right now so you can see it. This goes on the corner of your Surface and it holds the pin in place. Coolest thing ever. Clean stylus. Go to Surface Geeks, surfacegeeks.com. Click the banner ad. It's really cool. It's 20 bucks. How can you not buy one for 20 bucks? Really cool stuff. Kevin, I brought you on because uh, we had an int interesting conversation in the forums the other day. And it was about the TS-140, the Lenovo server. And I want to go over that. I want to cover a couple of things on just some news. Just some news. So, uh... Out there on Home Server Show, the blog, we I unboxed the Beyond Cloud, the Synology Beyond Cloud. Now, I'm going to admit to you that I kind of haven't done much else with it. I have torn it apart. I have torn it limb from limb to see what makes it tick, and I've yet to put it back together. So here's the deal. Since Jim's not here, Kev, I was going to send this to Jim, <laughs> but maybe maybe I should send it in pieces as a, as a little joke that you can have it if you put it back together. I was going to send this to Jim, but I kind of feel bad right now because it's in pieces and I've really been ornery to it. So maybe we'll just get Jim a new one. So uh, we'll we'll just get Jim a new one. You know, little by little. Part by part, piece by piece. By piece it's That's what I could do is just schedule some shipments once a week. <laughs> send two screws. Send the case. Send the motherboard. Send a hard drive. And it's those special hard drives with the uh, with the hack on the uh, the bootloader. So oh. we'll, we can keep up with Jim when he actually turns it on and reviews it. We'll know. Or some government agency will know. Somebody will. Somebody will. So Synology Beyond Cloud, it's kind of like it's kind of like the NAS for your family that really might not understand all the like RAID 
terminology and stuff. It's pretty cool. It's got some unboxing, got some first looks. Head out there to the, the blog and check up on that. Kevin, you know I'm a big fan. I don't have anything around me. I've got a pamphlet here. You know I'm a big fan of home automation, as well are you. Mm -hmm. And I've got some dealing gear uh, that I'm taking a look at. So, like, here's on video, uh, guys on the podcast, we're looking at just, just a, a little book. It's got uh, all kinds of gear uh, D-Link is coming out with to make their uh, home automation product line sing. And it's Wi-Fi enabled. It's not like Zigbee or Z-Wave or Instium. Mm -hmm. It's Wi-Fi enabled, so I've got some sprinkled through the house that I'm kind of playing with. Right now, it's real basic stuff. I've got some sensors, motion sensors, and I've got some plugs. But the cool thing about the plugs is they make one that will, like, it's almost like, uh, what is that one thing where you, you plug it? You plug it into the wall, and then you plug something into it, and it tells you how much power it's using. Oh, a kilowatt. That kilowatt, yeah, yeah. I've got one. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that built into more of these devices is the power measuring functions. Yes, seem to have gotten pretty uh, pretty easy for them to to uh, design in and do. Yeah, it's very cool. It is very cool. Wi-Fi smart plug. Smart plug lets you turn on your devices on and off. Plus, you can track your energy usage to save a few bucks on your next bill. Uh, this thing is really basic in the uh, in the discussion, but. Uh, well, and I think it's you know, and you and I kind of hopped into home automation just as the 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 better hubs were coming out, the uh, smart things and Revolve and Wink and these other guys, and um, kind of giving us a way to tie things together. And you know, Staples Hub was built by was it D Link to start with, and then Linksys or Linksys then D Link. Linksys um, then D Link, I believe. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I noticed uh, Netgear has a uh, a, a uh, Arlo camera to compete with my my little homeboy Your camera. Homeboy. The it's A R L O for anybody yep. keeping track at home. It I think it's a pretty cool little camera. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, those are actually. Yep. You know the whole idea. I like the wireless, movable. You know, battery. You know, uh, for me, cameras are something that I want to put in certain places for certain functions. We go out of town. You know, shine it at the back door, and it's motion sensor triggered. But back to to you know the D Link deal. I think we're going to see the networking guys really jump into this because they they can hit it from two sides. They can hit it from the fact that uh, you know it was a Zigbee Z-Wave Insteon network kind of thing, and now it's turning into a Bluetooth Wi-Fi network thing for the devices. Apple's going to drive a lot of that with their HomeKit stuff, and uh, you know, so so I think we're heading into a, a good, you know, even a better time moving ahead here with device compatibility, and uh, you know, I think our our in the future our hubs will probably be. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Z-Wave, Zigbee—you know all be, all the different protocols in our in our home network. Yeah, you know, I even see it. We might just be into a Wi-Fi future. You know, come five years down the road, we may not even be talking about all these Z-Wave type Zigbees yep. and Insteons. It may just be Wi-Fi. Well, especially with the the product that you uh, put in for on the Kickstart. Um, you know this. This whole uh, Wi-Fi mesh fabric uh, concept is is really getting driven by a lot of the mm -hmm. um, the home automation guys, and you know it's I, I'm I'm kind of a fan of you know having separate wireless access points, trying to have as few as possible. But I I realize I'm I'm very lucky in that my my I have a two-story house with a basement. It's it's so it's a big rectangular box. I have a uh, I have a uh, um, a linen closet on the upper floor that's exactly in the middle of the house and I have a very strong wireless access point mounted right to the ceiling there and I cover my whole house with one access point. Wow. But, well, you're in a... I mean, that's not unlike a lot of folks. But, but you know, I've, I've been to your house and you couldn't cover your house with one access point because no, of the I way can't. it's designed. And I, <laughs> it's very frustrating for me that uh, I can't put them exactly where I want them. Right. You know, I'm I'm kind of done having kids, so I'm thinking, you know, access points. I would put one under my pillow. <laughs> <laughs> better, you know, speed while I'm in bed reading, but you know, the 
the spousal acceptance factor. He's just really not there. Nope. Have the access point, you know, under the beds of your children it doesn't work. <laughs> so, um, so you mentioned that if uh, if you guys listening head over to McCabe.io. That's my personal blog. I I show you that I had a little change of heart on Wi-Fi. So let me go over there, McCabe.io. I'm currently running. Uh, a product called Ubiquity. I know you guys have heard that. Uh, you've heard me talk about it. You've heard me talk well about it. You've heard me talk ill about it. Um, so these guys, Eero, came out and they started talking about you know three hundred dollars for their solution. I'm like three hundred dollars. That's all I thought about. That's why it hit my head first. Three hundred dollars for Wi-Fi? You're crazy. Well, I got to thinking about it, and I paid two hundred dollars for my solution of Wi-Fi for three access points and it's 2.4 gigahertz and that's it it's nothing else it's B, G and N and Eero is offering for $300 it's, it was a limited price it has since gone up but for $300 they're giving you the whole thing so a, B, G, N, and A, C. That was important to me because I was about to pull the trigger on some speed upgrades. And I started looking at if I wanted to get... I needed a long-range access point. So I needed a long-range access point, And those are uh, three for $236. If you want to go up to A, C, one single access point was 270 bucks. 270 bucks. So I immediately went out, uh, ate crow, stuck a shoe in my mouth, chewed it, enjoyed it, threw down my money, $300, and purchased the Eero. It's not a Kickstarter, but it kind of is a Kickstarter. But it's they've gathered my money, Kevin. They charged my card. Mm -hmm. They took my money, and they're going to make the product with my money. Yep. Now, these guys made a million bucks in 48 hours by doing this. They had some pretty whiz-bang marketing, some real beautiful people, some... Uh, actually, there was one kind of ugly guy uh, in one of the videos. Um, so, but you know, when I'm talking about whiz-bang marketing, hey, we can do it all. We're a, we're a slicer, we're a dicer, and they make you believe that this product is going to deliver, so we're going to see. So my goal here is to hopefully get their product, cover my house with three access points, and sell my Ubiquity product. So if anybody's looking for some 2.4 gigahertz access points, I may have some for sale. I may like part it out, maybe sell one or two. And um, I don't know. I, I, I'm The jury is still out. I assume that since you only need one, you didn't partake of that deal, Kevin? I, I, I did not, but I did recommend it to several folks and uh, and I've, I've I've actually through work have ended up with a uh, a, a enterprise grade access hub. Right right now I'm running an ingenious uh, EAP 600. It's been a great uh, dual radio, continuous dual radio. Um, and the, my company sells a brand called Xerus, and I ended up with one of their access points. But I, I, it's way more than I need in the house. But I might use it just for the sake of using one of the products that we sell. Um, for the guys listening to Xerus has, uh, we've talked about it out in the forum several times, they've got a great tool to measure your Wi-Fi performance. So it's not based on their product. You can use it with anybody's Wi-Fi product, uh, and that works very, very well. Um, on the subject of Wi-Fi, it's popped up over on Surface Geeks a few times. It's popped up on Home Server Show a few times. Uh, about sporadic Wi-Fi disconnect issues and uh, lo and behold my wife's HP laptop finally started exhibiting the problem. Uh, it's got an Intel wireless adapter in it and it just was really, really tough to troubleshoot. Um, you know, kind of, kind of quickly figured out if I put in a regular USB Wi-Fi plug, it worked fine. Hardware worked fine, uh, and it seems like if it's running off battery, then it's it's more sporadic, and uh, 
several things I found if, if you're running into that problem um, you got to go into power settings and tell the OS Windows 8 really tries to power manage uh, Wi-Fi connections but also my my new thing I learned today is some of the wireless products out there from Intel and from Qualcomm have an issue that is called I lost it here uh, packet reordering problems apparently these Ethernet wireless products start misaligning packets and uh, causes fallouts so uh, I'll throw it in show notes uh, Intel is has that, several um, fixes for it is this a I would assume that this is primarily a Haswell product that it's happening on um, well it's actually their Centrino uh, Wi-Fi products but that would be linked to Haswell's and and if you think about uh, Microsoft Surface products. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they all have uh, Intel Wi-Fi in them. I'd have to go double check that to be sure. But I know we've run into several connectivity issues, and it it seems to be a kind of a common uh, issue. Yes, I think, uh, and it has Intel written all over it. We hear it a lot. So hopefully, the, it won't be an issue by the time my Eero arrives this summer. <laughs> And I can give everybody a nice review about how wonderful my Wi-Fi is. And uh, maybe I'll even have like a brand new Surface by then. Hopefully we'll have uh, new hardware, Windows 10, everything. Life will be grand. Oh, we can only hope. <laughs> we can only good. hope. It's all good. A couple of weeks ago we talked about should you move up to server 2016 or wait for uh, a new server or go ahead and buy Essentials. Essentials server, which is actually a 2012 product. Well, Microsoft has come out and said they're pushing back server uh, v.next. That's a keyword in the industry, v.next, which is next version. And um, we're not going to see anything until next year. Next year. So Microsoft had a blog post, and uh, they're not going to keep it tied with Windows 10. They're kind of severing, I think it's a good move. Um, they're kind of severing that cycle where, you know, the consumer OS and the server OS don't necessarily live be by the same drum. They're, they're not on the yep. same schedule, which is actually a good thing. You know, put it out when it's ready. So I'll put that notes, uh, that in the show notes. I'll try to get that out there. I've been, uh, I've been talking about a phone, a Sagus version 2. If you go over to McCabe.io, you can find the phone that I found at CES that I thought was the coolest thing ever. And I would really like one. I need to check back in with these guys because I talked to them quite a bit. And, uh, but that's over at McCabe.io. It's the Sagus version 2. If you like Android phones, you're, you're going to love this phone. Um, what I tried to do, Kevin, is I was like, you know, I, I don't want to like crater a company, right? You don't want to be that guy that comes in and says, hey, have you ever thought of this? <laughs> and, you know, they go home and they're like, hey, what if we do this? You know, and then bam, the stock dies and the company dies. But I told them, I said, you guys would be really, really optimized to publish, create a Windows phone. I was like, you, the way that they're trying to get the OS out there and they're mm -hmm. trying to discount it, I said, you guys could work with them. You could put out a flagship Windows phone. Awesome Windows phone. These guys have, it's got dual micro SD slots. You can put two 128 SD cards in this thing. <laughs> it's got unbelievable unbelievable features and you just really need to take a look so go out to mccabe.io check out that article cool stuff we have beat to death the fact that Radio Shack is going out of business but I was showing you Kevin prior to going live some cool I bought some resistors at Radio Shack and I created a um, I, I think the proper term is dummy plug it's a VGA yep. dummy plug on video I am showing that on uh, YouTube but um, this is for my Android. It's not Android. It's a it's a Google uh, Play. It's a hockey puck. It's just a, a Roku, uh, Amazon Fire TV kind of thing. 
and I wanted to use it just for audio only. But so I said, hey, I'll just convert. Um, I'll just buy this HDMI out that has an audio out, and I'll run that into a set of speakers or my home audio, and everything will be fine. But not um, without something plugged into the VGA port, it yep. kills That's the audio. Load. Yep. It says no load. We're not turning on. I'm not outputting to you. So I just provided a load with my silly resistors. Actually, I have a an actual VGA uh, here with some uh, with solder cups on the back, and I'm going to fix it up and uh, probably heat shrink around it and make it real nice and pretty, and then I'll plug it in and zip it away. But I was able to Chromecast to it and send audio to it. Real nice. So it's just a device that I'm not using. I bought it. I'm not using it. So I either sell it or I try this. So speaking of Radio Shack, and I posted these up on home server, but if your local store is open, the deals are getting better all the time. This was a really nice little Targus tripod that my Microsoft Studio Cam sets right on top of on there. Yeah. very nicely. Um, picked up a USB hub for a heck of a deal. Picked up uh, uh, anybody into the Arduino kind of build-it-yourself stuff. There were still quite a few of those boards there at reasonable prices. So um, stop on in and and uh, yeah. And, and and the sad thing about it, the day I was there, I, I've always had this saying about Radio Shack. If I have to buy something that I know I'm going to end up paying retail for, I'll go buy it there, and I never complain about it mm -hmm. because Radio Shack, for me, my parents are in their 80s, my wife's parents are in their late 70s, and when they need something, I just send them to Radio Shack because I know they get taken care of. And while I was buying stuff there the other day, an old guy came in and the kid replaced the batteries in his hearing aid while he was standing there waiting. Uh, another elderly couple came in to uh, you know pick up a new cordless phone, and you know people always complained about Radio Shack's prices, but the service they delivered to people who needed help w is phenomenal. And you know those people aren't going to have a place to go get that kind of support. Yeah. That is a shame, isn't it? You'd you'd think it, you know, and obviously you know, price price kind of rules these days. But uh, you'd think you'd be able to make a go of it. But yeah, there's a there's a whole whole laundry list of where Radio Shack went wrong. Went you know did things right, did things wrong. So uh, yeah, it, it it is a shame. It is a shame. I've got. Um, uh, have you ever used Google Earth, Kevin? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, nice little product where you can kind of zoom in and zoom out and look at all this stuff. But uh, Google Earth has gone free. Uh, Google Earth Pro. I'm sorry. Wow, really? Google Google Earth has always been free. Google Earth uh, Pro is now free if you just ask for a key. So it seems like. They weren't making any money on the product. I'm going to put the link in the show notes, guys. And it's also on the live feed. They weren't making any money off of it, so they said, well, we'll just um, we'll give away a key for free. Now, I got my key. Uh, try this uh, for yourself. Just go out to just Google, Google Earth Pro, and uh, there's a little request a key button out there, and try it. So I got my key. I have not, um, have not tried it yet. I'm not like turned it on and installed it and all that kind of cool, cool stuff. But supposedly it gives you a lot more uh, detail and a lot more things that you can do with it. It's $399 value. Wow. So That's very good. Use it uh, Use it a lot. It's been on the forums, but PFSense 2.2 was released, and there were some issues with it uh, for guys upgrading, so you might want to check out. Uh, before you upgrade and install, go out to the forums. Uh, look for the PFSense 2.2 uh, thread. Make sure you uh, read before you upgrade. Dish Sling TV. It's out. It's available. $20 gets you all kinds of cool uh, channels. You can get... Uh, I don't even remember offhand. I, I know um, travel channels on there. Food channels on there. Uh, ESPN. ESPN2. So... Uh, Cord cutters, if you need a couple of channels, 20 bucks gets you, I think, even like Disney Family or something crazy like that. Uh, really good stuff. Let's see. 
I think I'm good. Okay. Let's talk, let's talk some servers. Alrighty. So, you posted the Lenovo ThinkStation P300 Tower Workstation, mm -hmm. 700 bones. Yep. It had just a massive list of features to it. We're talking a Xeon processor, uh, 3.4 gigahertz, uh, 16 gigs of RAM, 256 uh, gig uh, SSD, it was 700 bones. And I got to thinking, and I think I think out loud in the forums, like, that mm -hmm. would make a good streaming server for me. I need some horsepower. Yeah. I'm looking for a Core i7 uh, processor, which I've since purchased, but um, I was like, that would make a good streaming server. And so the conversation, it was on, Kev. It's just, you know, it just takes a couple of little, like, the stupid questions for me. And, you know, people pop in, oh, have you done this? Have you done this? Have you look at this? But you guys showed me that the TS-140 from Lenovo, the server, it's kind of almost, it's kind of almost bare bones. We'll talk about yep. it. Is basically the same box. Yeah, tell it me, is. Tell me about this 140, Kev. Refresh my memory. So the, the 140 is the entry-level server from Lenovo. It's uh, the, the Dell T20 and the, the Lenovo TS140. Um, pretty basic um, Intel designs, Intel chipset designs. Uh, they come with either an i3 or a, a, a Xeon processor. Um, not sure how Lenovo actually does it. I was as we were talking here, I was looking back through some of the deals, and if you're interested in these, go out, go out to deals at Home Server Show uh, and and scroll through them. The lowest I think we ever saw was was like two hundred dollars for a base unit with an i3. I want to say you know three forty nine for the Xeon with four gig, but uh, I think they even dipped down under three hundred at one point in time. You know, so pretty pretty outrageously low price there. And I think the comparative that that you know people were looking at was, uh, hey, seven hundred for that. And and what Lenovo does is they use sometimes the same basic board and chassis, put a little different faceplate on it, call some boxes a server, call some boxes a workstation. The workstations usually come with better graphics and, mm -hmm. and or an added in graphic card. Uh, but in this case, I just kind of walked through it with, um, you know, what do we do? We all, we, we, we run off and we buy something like the TS-140 or a HP microserver. And I, I find it a little humorous that we all kind of get crazy about whether it's 299 or 349 and then we start laying down $500 for disk drives and $200 yeah. for memory and, you know, and, and everything. So before you know it, it's a thousand dollars. So right, you know. So the the uh, if you add it up, the seven hundred dollars, uh, not a bad deal. But if you've already got SSDs or if you already have some memory, you already have some hard drives, the TS one forty is is really a great uh, a great route to go. We'll see if I can flip my. Uh, didn't mean to do that. Let's see if I can flip my camera over here, and uh, we'll go live. And there she is. And there she is. So the one thing, you know, some people when they uh, are building up one of these boxes, there are two five and a quarter bays on the front of the box, but there's a bar in between them. So if you're thinking about putting in one of those mobile racks, that would tend not to work because you got a bar in between the two. Um, I'll pop this guy off and swing it open. You can see how one bay is here. Um, and you really want to check your part numbers on the TS-140s because some come with a slim uh, DVD drive up top and there's room for a hard drive underneath there. And then this five and a quarter bay could be a five and a quarter device or there's actually a, uh, I'll see if I can pop it out here, but there's actually um, a couple of fans in there and space for a hard drive in there as well. Okay. And there's a little room up above. I think I, you, you, know, you could probably just squeeze one in there. Um, this spot is the floppy spot, but obviously you can put a drive in there. And you can get two SSDs in there. Can, can, oh, yeah. can I, um, can yep. I dremel out that uh, separator bar and put in like a, a five and three? Um, like five I don't think so. Well, you, you, you might be able to, but you'd still have a gap there. So yeah, there's not there's not much metal, metal between there. You could you could dremel that out and put something okay. bigger in there. Um, and then inside here, like you say, you could put two SSDs in this floppy base spot here. And then you've got two really quite nice drive carriers that uh, 
one here and one here for three and a half inch drives, and then there's a uh, a fan to uh, push air to cool those guys. So it's pretty yeah. pretty well laid out internally. Fans up here on these bays, fans in the front of these uh, five and a quarter inch bays. They went the bash, are falling, Things are falling all over the place. Um, but to look at this five and a quarter bay, they throw a fan right in the front of it. So that's nice. So you can uh, pull air over whatever. Yep. So you got uh, so they they really do think uh, think about these guys and lay them out pretty nicely. Well, you know, I show you where you put your drives, Kev. You see the at the bottom there where you've got the cable holder. It's yep. kind of a in yellowish vignette. Yeah, so you pull that off and you just stack them <laughs> there. You can put quite a few there. I, in in my in my way of wanting to always modify stuff, I was looking for better spots to add more drives in here, and I just I haven't come up with a better spot for it. But you could easily put you know four three and a half inch hard drives in here and two SSDs and have a pretty well rounded little server. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a perfect little RAID five set with um. With a mirrored OS on SSD, that's a great. I mean, that's a great entry-level server. Even, uh, I mean, you could do 2011. You could do Essentials. Yep. Server 2012. You could do some virtual machines, especially if you're running a Xeon with uh, put 16 gig in there. Yep. So run, run me around the motherboard, okay? So the the, the base unit, you've got lots of uh, USB, um, high-speed USB. Um, as I hit my mic. Um, interesting thing, this guy does have two display ports on it, and we know how some some of the folks in the forums like to use their servers as uh, um, home theater PCs. These display ports actually pass the audio, so this one does work. The uh, Dell T20 does not pass audio I over the display that port. Issue, yep. So another nice feature of this guy, um, a single Ethernet port on the back here, but you've got plenty of slots inside, so you've got an old PCI slot to throw a gig Ethernet card in if you'd like. You've got two um, by 16 slots, so if you did want to run this as a workstation kind of product, you could put a couple of graphic cards in, mm -hmm. and then one uh, PCI um, 1X slot yeah, in there yeah, as well. Yeah, 1X. Yeah, yeah, you're definitely going to want to throw in a, like a dual NIC kind of or a quad NIC card, especially if you're going to run some VMs. Oh, it's absolutely. Got, it's got the little it, on the back there. Does it have the little quick arm where you can just pop off? Uh, yeah, it does. You just pop that guy down, folds yeah. right out, and uh, it's just a little snap you push on the inside to get it to drop. That's cool. I always like when they did that. So a lot of people hate that. They'd rather just do the screws, but I I get tired of dropping screws into uh, into the box. So if I can just oh, yeah. snap it shut, I'm I'm a happy camper. Um, two, you know, one of the things we worry about with the HP microservers is power. This has a 280 watt power supply, so, you know, loading it down with all the bays full, you're really not going to run into any power issues with it. Um, it. Has four memory slots on it, so you could do 32 gig of memory on it, which, you know, a lot of the other boxes are limited to 16. So, like you say, for running ESXi, um, could be a, a very good uh, virtualized box as well. Awesome. How's uh, how's the noise there on that on that CPU fan? It's really uh, very quiet. Uh, it's probably one of the quieter boxes I've seen. The uh, CPU fan and the big back fan are uh, are pretty silent. And the external. And what are the last two ports at the very top? One's VGA. Uh, that's your serial port for your modem. You got that okay. 56k modem. You got that it, serial port right there. Does it support 9600 baud? I I think you could probably squeeze 9600 out of it. All it right. might you might be pushing it a little bit. maybe even. <laughs> <laughs> not even yet. Not even at 56k yet. We're still V.36. <laughs> For some reason, every every entry server I see still has a, a serial port on nice it. I'm port. not sure why. Very nice. I'm sure, I'm sure somebody at the factory realizes they still sell U, UPSs with serial cables and. Isn't that crazy? They still do. I wonder if people are like this is an oddest looking VGA cable. I can't get my I can't get my work. The one monitor works fine, but when I try to plug into the second one, it don't work. <laughs> Damn monitor is broken. What the hell? Right. Um, that's a good looking box. Oh yeah, it's a good looking box. 
And and like you know, I, I guess I, I I used to rave about HP from the point of view of documentation. Um, I've come to find that Dell and Lenovo both do really well with uh, maintenance and repair manuals. Which, even if you, I I find it odd that uh, you know the kind of the best technical information comes in that maintenance and repair manual because that's there for the guys who are out servicing these things. And you know they show you how to take the thing apart. They show you what all the options were. They show you what all the part numbers were for every op that possibly could come with it so there's a lot of good stuff in those guides and uh, they're uh, pretty easy access to all that stuff it's looking good so you just bought it to play with it are you uh, did you have to power something important down in order to do this podcast uh, no this uh, I, I I should probably make it sound like I actually do something with this but this <laughs> one was just sitting on the bench I <laughs> nice. Kind of like my uh, N54L sitting behind me, which I've like never put into full operation. Well, and that's you know, and and I'm I'm focusing on a lot of this entry level stuff from this point of view. Um, the the other one that I'm uh, looking at is uh, we just picked up Fujitsu as a product line, and they've always had a really cool entry level server. So I'm waiting to see what that one comes in at price wise. But when you mentioned the N54L, I'm kind of looking at things. Uh, and you've you've seeded the forums a couple of times with the entry level server type of thing, and I've been playing around with that idea a lot. Of well, what what can I really do with an N54L? You know, eight gig of memory, and I can put four drives in the front. I can put actually two five and a quarters up in the or two three and a halves up in the top. And do I run free NAS on it, or maybe I run Windows 8 and make Windows 8 look like a server on it? So I'm starting to play around a lot more with kind of looking back at some of the older tech and figuring out what we can do with it. Um, I've got a post up there for as I segue to my other show and tell. Um, <laughs> the uh, just I'm enamored for with you listening at home. The TS140 is actually sitting on top of an HP HP uh, workstation. Sorry, <laughs> HP. I love you. What do we got here? Um, this is an HP pizza box. You know, if you've if you've worked in any office, you've either had Dell, HP, or Lenovo pizza box. Um, they're a little taller than what a pizza box would be, but I find these boxes are great for. You mentioned PF Sense earlier. You yep. can find these things for you know. And a quick segue: if you're in the Minneapolis St. Paul Twin Cities area and you don't know about a store named Reboot, you got to go to Reboot because Reboot is that where is, they resell. Yeah, they they're a recycling place, but they they sell the better stuff, uh, you know, before it goes to the grinder for recycling. Right. So you know, like that, uh, I got this guy um, for I want to say it was fifty bucks, and uh, the one I've been talking about up on the uh, uh, on the po uh, the the forums is a model that comes with an AMD processor. And it's kind of how this stuff kind of fits together. You know, this is like a 2009 kind of time frame. So we're in the Pentium Core Duo kind of area, right. the, yeah. the phenoms from AMD. And there was kind of a weird thing at a point in time there with, um, with um, chipsets and how they handled memory. And the Intel chipsets couldn't handle high chip count uh, memory modules, and the AMDs could. So basically, I bought an AMD version of this box for uh, about 50 bucks, um, got 16 gig of memory for 50 bucks, and got a uh, quad core phenom processor for about 30 bucks. So for 130 bucks, I've got a 16, you know, 16 gig older quad core processor. Um, I loaded Windows 8.1 on it, which I had a copy of that for 39 bucks, and. Uh, you know, basically, I'm experimenting with well, what would a server look like with that? And mm -hmm. my my daughter's into Minecraft, so we've got a couple of virtual machines running with Minecraft servers on them, on top of Windows 7. And you know, probably not the right thing for everybody, but this recycling of the old stuff is is a great way to learn it without getting in too deep right off the bat. Yeah. And and you know, you're sub two hundred dollars for something that's actually quite acceptable from a performance point of view. Yeah, it's, it's good to remind folks that uh, take a look at any kind of computer recycling place or take a look in your own backyard. If the company you work for uh, recycles some of these, I was able to buy <clears> – <throat> I bought my PF Sense box, which is an old HP pizza box, and actually it's thinner than that, 
I mean, we're talking a micro thin. Uh, it was a Pentium D or and maybe a Pentium Four. It was a Pentium D. Um, and I threw a NIC in there, and it ran PFSense for several years, and I still use it as my uh, is my backup. It's still sitting there. If the router I'm using now, you know, should die, I would just plug in PFSense, and it would take right off with my uh, dedicated IP address. But um, it's always a good way to go, especially if you're going to run something like that. Yeah. So this this guy ultimately this will be my next uh, um, for my firewall. I'm moving to Sophos. And uh, this Read guy, my mind. I, I popped in. A, so the uh, onboard gigabit will be the management port. The first gigabit Ethernet card here, which was a cheapie because it was a standard old PCI. I think I had some laying around. And um, so that will be the in coming from my cable modem. This will be my DMZ out. And then... I've gone to a, uh, it's a dual port Ethernet card that I found very cheap because it's fiber connections. So this will be, one will be the production for the house, the other will be the lab connection. And I'm going to, uh, I picked up a couple of Netgear uh, switches, uh, pro, uh, pro switches, pro safes I think they're called, and mm -hmm. uh, just updated the code on those. They take little SFPs on the end, so I'll run nice. fiber from here to there. And, uh, you know, once again, I think this was a $50 box off Craigslist. Uh, memory, 8 gigs, sent me 50 bucks on this, and I had a uh, quad-core Pentium processor to pop into it. So, you know, some of the some of the nice part about these things is the um, if you got parts and pieces laying around. But like you say, um, our own companies are getting rid of this stuff because it doesn't do what they want to do, and it doesn't mean it's not useful or or functioning. Right. Yeah, we need to have a we need to have a big show about uh, Sophos. I know that uh, when we did our router, uh, my my router is better than your router show. Uh, we didn't really touch on Sophos a lot, and well, actually we did touch on it. It's just I think we all agreed that hey, we need to try that. So and I really need I'm I'm saving the N54L behind me. I want to run that, and I I need something to do uh, security for my network. And you know, do some reporting, do some antivirus and stuff like that. So, I'm really looking forward to doing a show like that. But hey, Kevin, uh, in the chat room, someone's asking about that TS140 about the onboard RAID. We I didn't even ask you what what that thing has in it, uh, just built onto the board for RAID. So it has the um, it has the regular. So it'd be the Intel chipset, the C. I'd have to look it up. I think it's a C. 226, so it's their regular controller, okay. um, which supports their chipset RAID, and I, I was looking at the uh, the post there as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not a big fan of chipset RAID. Um, it's not it's maybe not bad for mirroring a couple of data drives. I don't think I would use it for mirroring OS drives. Um, I'd either go with a, kind of my preference is when it comes to RAID is real real RAID controllers, real RAID cards, um, or software RAIDs, and then chipset probably you know way farther down the line. But it does support the full Intel chipset which uh, of RAID, um, which technically can support RAID 5, but I, I would never do RAID 5 on a chipset. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm going to send that that question out to that link right there that I just posted in the forums I mean in the in the the live feed there's a as, as Kevin says uh, seeding the forums I seed the forums quite a bit I'll uh, I throw some real just just nice fat pitches for you guys to just knock out of the park and uh, and I just wait for you guys to you know start swinging but the one that I put out there's the Lenovo TS140 upgrades, and I said, "Hey, I've, let's say I've got a TS140. Let's upgrade it. You know, fill it up. Give me some links. So uh, linkage, and uh, how would you upgrade it? And uh, man, right off the bat, JM Wills hit it and said, "Okay, first of all, I found it cheaper. Bam, 329. <laughs> so that's what I like to see when you when I throw those softballs, those meatball pitches. I like to see guys taking swings at them." So that's pretty cool. I'm going to put that link in the show notes for you guys as well.
You bet. Um, I really need to get that N54L dug out. You know, Kev, I have my laundry list is so huge right now, and the reason I missed a couple of shows is I'm doing I'm doing taxes. I've got science projects for kids, and I've got this year's um, Pinewood Derby car still uh, in the box. Oh no! Pinewood Derby is next Friday, so we have to make a car, and we have to make it quick. So, I'm actually kind of hoping that we do have uh, delayed school tomorrow, or maybe even canceled school tomorrow because of weather, so me and the boy can start hacking away on. Uh, on a Pinewood Derby car, but sorry, life just gets in the way, but you know what, it's, I'm trying to not let it get in the way of my smart things upgrades, and today, I had the coolest thing happen, everything worked as it should, Kev, really, I went downstairs, I looked in my dashboard, smart things, and I looked at a couple of controllers that I put in quite some time ago and they're uh, wet sensors so I bought these uh, these uh, water sensors from Lowe's which were not fish officially supported at the time and I installed them downstairs I have two sump pits one is a uh, sewer that is um, that pumps from the basement and gets it up and gets it out to the street right and um, the other one is just uh, just a pure pit for you know water trickling in, bam, pump it out. So if any of that should fail, my basement turns into a pool. It's a perfect place for sensors. So I go down there and no, I looked at the sensors today in my uh, dashboard for smart things, and the batteries both said 100%. And I was like, oh great, these things are not working. I was about ready. If there was a bus nearby, my smart things hub might have been under it. So if this is the point where you don't tweet, you test. Mm -hmm. I went down there with a little bowl, filled it up in the sink, I popped the lid to one of those things, propped it open, and I just held it under the sensor. Didn't take it out, didn't do anything. I just held it under the sensor. My phone was sitting two feet away. Bam! Text yep. message. Got it. The sensor went off, said wet. I dropped it out, and almost immediately, two seconds later, it went dry. The sensor went dry. And this is the same one when I installed it that I had trouble yep. of the sensor resetting. Could not get the dang thing to reset. And it went wet to dry almost immediately. I got the text, and I got the push notification. Even better, even better, Kev, my home phone rings. Really? Immediately. Guess who's calling? Your the wife. wife. The wife. <laughs> she got the push. She said, you need to go check the basement. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> system That's great. worked. The system worked. Now, the system would be even better if I had my camera fixed. Um, supposedly, when I did this, I had a, a little D-Link camera mounted in the basement. It's up high, and it's shooting down. So what's supposed to happen is the sensor goes off, turns the light on, because I have a Z-Wave light, uh, but I was already in there, so the light was on via motion. And you're supposed to be able to say, ooh, I got a, I got a notification. So I go into the... You're supposed to be able to touch the camera and get a quick snapshot. Well, that part's not working because cameras and smart things sometimes don't get along. Uh, you have to just be patient with it. But the system worked. So I was very proud of my, uh, my home automation moment. Uh, and it was just a test. It was just a test. Well, and, and that one specifically has, you know, that, that, that's a great use for smart things because those, and I think they have made some modifications to get those water sensors to uh, trigger and trip, you know, accurately. I know you and I both had some problems with them we right did, up front. And I looked through to see, because you can look through, they, they provide a nice little list for you, and I looked up and I saw them listed in there, Everspring. Um, yep. And I was like, oh, they're added now. 
And so that's what it takes sometimes is yep. for a couple of guys to buy the, the new item, go out to the forums and say, hey, smart things, can you kind of get this to work for me? It's kind of kludgy. Works a little bit. doesn't work a lot. And they go and buy it, and then they get it added to their system. So, And that's what it's taken me to do, Kev, is I've, I haven't played with my smart things in, I mean, months, literally months. And I'm coming up with... Uh, a list of it's like a cut list. Here's some things that I want to do, right? And first, I needed to. I kept telling myself, "Well, I've tested so much on this system that maybe I should just reset it. Maybe I should just reset it." And I started reading a couple of links about smart things and resetting. I was like, "Wow, that's probably not the most fun thing to do, you know, because you have to." Um, Every single device on that SmartThings hub, you have to remove properly. Otherwise, you cannot re-add it properly. Right. So I removed all of the things that I tested recently, like uh, if this, then that. Uh, I removed Ubi. And a couple of things that were kind of cludging up the gears, which I think that was. And So the only thing I have left is, for some reason, my phone, my Android phone, it does not know me. Mm -hmm. The phone can come and go and it still thinks it's present <clears throat> so I'm having an issue with that once I fix that I think my system is kind of back to back to normal and I can start playing with going about my uh, actually I call it version one where I'm adding some some sensors and some light switches and then and then I want to go full on kind of alarm panel with this thing uh, there's a lot of things out there, smart things, uh, to go to alarm panel, and I really want to do that. So, I just had to share as we close the show. I had mm -hmm. to share my my uh, monumental moment. You know, you read so many things about someone someone getting up to uh, watching a movie says, "Hey, I need to turn that light out. It's killing the movie." No, wait, wait, wait. I'll get it. <laughs> Gets his phone out, and it it won't turn off, or he can't dim it. You know. Home automation fail. It it happens all the time, but this time uh, it worked, and I was I was very I was tickled. Yeah, no, that's great to hear. And to your point, I think I run into a lot of the same where I do so much goofing around and testing with it. I, d I don't get too upset when certain things don't work on smart things, but like you just said, I'm I'm heading into the same area of I'm looking at my dashboard, going, you know, where's that sensor? I, I have no idea where that sensor is. It was something <laughs> yeah. I turned on and I was playing with. I got to I got to clean up that kind of stuff, and uh, and now I'm ready to do more of the proximity stuff. I mean, I I had things pretty well ready to go with that little mini remote, remote to where my wife pulls up, she hits that, garage door goes up. Uh, door into the house from the garage unlocks, lights turn on in the house, Sonos turns on, and it, you know, I, and I think I'm about ready now to go back to trying that with proximity. And you know, the only thing with proximity is coming and going and present sensors. But um, I've even got my, you know, and now that Smart Things is on Windows Phone, um, my my wife has come to realize how nice it is that if she's running late to get home. Um, she can look at her phone and see that our daughter's present sensor is in the house. So you know, you know, she got off the bus and she got into the house okay, and and life is good. Yeah, absolutely. That's um, that's what I want. And proximity is such a cool thing to play with. Um, you know, if I pull into the garage and it notices, hey, Dave's here. Yeah, turn that light on for me. You know, yeah. let me get into the house without breaking my neck over backpacks and shoes and you know and you know and I do think one of the side benefits is the whole wearable thing you know I, I'm thinking wearables more from triggering things with home automation maybe than even the wearable aspect of it because I don't always have my phone on me but if if I had a Fitbit or you know whatever tied into uh, you know going having it sense when you're in certain rooms of the house and having that trigger things that's logic that I, I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And you, know, you, you and I both have Ubi's, and you know, I think the more that technology gets played with, um, the more that can tie into this as well. Yeah, and I got to go ahead to do the basement. Um, uh, the wife kind of like finally got sick of the boys. They leave the lights on like crazy. We have these expensive, you know, beautiful halogen lamps that you know, real nice light. 
but they're expensive and they burn electricity. So I need to be shutting them off when there's no movement after X amount of time. Absolutely. So and, and you hopefully you see the glow on my face of my desk lamp and of course yeah. demos demos never work so we'll try it. Okay, Ubi. Turn off the desk lamp. Yes. It works. Ta -da. Ta -da. Ubi smart things light switches it works. Yeah. Yes, she does. Uh, you and I worked through a couple of Ubi utterances the other day, and uh, I got I, my lamp is still back here, but I have since removed her from my smart thing, so she yep. has no idea. Well, and the and the Evernote stuff you you and I were working on, I I'm actually using that, you know, to for shopping lists and different things. I'll be sitting here working on something, and I'll tell Ubi to throw some stuff on grocery list or shopping list. So, um, it's not perfect yet, but I I I think this we're on the very early phases of this technology. Absolutely, you know, and we talked about it. I want to do. If you guys are interested in more of that, I want to do a a YouTube with. Kevin and kind of walk through his setup of the Evernote, uh, Ubi to Evernote kind of thing, and that that way everybody can see how to set it up uh, visually, and then we can walk through that. Because uh, yeah, I'm interested in doing it, and uh, because my Amazon Echo is never going to get here. <laughs> Actually, I got moved up. I'm in April now, so my delivery was moved. I got an email. From Amazon, I don't. Maybe they heard me talking about being upset. Yeah, <laughs> the three little, three-letter lady sitting behind me. I, I don't like saying her name because she pops up. <laughs> <laughs> the voice of the internet. She's pretty cool. I have fun with it. the boys. Love this thing. Oh God, yeah. If you go through my the log of utterances talking to this thing, the boys are up here. How does a train work? <laughs> what do snowflakes look like? You know, just, oh my god! After a while, Ubi's like, "Please go back downstairs." Um, so I'll let you go, Kev. But also, um, you mentioned something. Um, Minecraft servers. I think this is another thing that we should probably oh, yeah. hit, and we should probably hit it visually, and uh, do a YouTube, maybe do a home server show podcast on setting up Minecraft servers. Um. You put the bug in me, and well, actually, you didn't. <laughs> I, I read your list, and my five-year-old and seven-year-old are just—you know how they hear everything, right? Yep. And they come over. They're like, "Dad, you can make a server for Minecraft." <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh well, yeah, we could possibly make a server." And like, "Oh my God, do it now! Do it now! Do it now!" <laughs> they didn't. They thought I could just, you know, one keystroke and. Here's a server. Poof. Magically. Oh, they were just Jones and Ford. So I spent uh, a couple of hours last weekend while it was cold. I got a server running. I got JavaScript or uh, Java running. Uh, I had issues. I had RAM trouble. I had server properties trouble. You name it, I had trouble getting this done. Got the server running. And then I was like, okay, boys, bring your iPads over here. So gave them the IP address, gave them the port number, and it wouldn't connect. Really? And I'm, they're just they're bummed. They're bummed because I'm at the point where I'm asking them, "Do you want creative or survival?" <laughs> and these kids, you can just see the foam <laughs> coming out of them. They're just like, "Oh my God, you're the coolest dad ever!" <laughs> and I didn't read enough. The actual official Minecraft server is not compatible with Minecraft PE, which is Pocket oh, Edition, yep. which is on the iPad. So I had to break the news to them. Sorry, boys. I need to get Minecraft yep. PE, which there is software for. Yep. And I just need to get it going. So I think I'm going to have... They do have it on their Xbox, and I just I didn't want to change gears that much with them. Go downstairs, fire up the Xbox, and, and see if it works. But I need to see if that works. And yep. then I'm going to fire up another VM and run um, run it, uh, the, the PE edition. I think I'm just going to run it on the same uh, Windows 7. Yeah, you can probably run in the same spot. 
my, yeah. my we, we ran the standard server because my daughter runs uh, on a laptop and it connected uh, you know and she was impressed with the speed because of course your gigabit network across the house here and what she's tying into so yeah um, much better than what they connect to via the internet. oh yeah yeah. yeah. So very good stuff. Well, good. Yeah, those would make great shows. Let me know. Yeah. Uh, so I got. To, I have tons there. of questions for you. Tons of questions. The boys are already like, "Well, where can I get these worlds? Can I? <laughs> I had this Titanic that I built, and what do I do with it? Can I load it into the server, Dad? Hey, can I do this? Can I do this? I'm like, oh my God, you're killing me. You're killing me. I first started with Ubuntu, and I had a miserable fail with that. I, I loaded a Ubuntu yeah. server. I couldn't get it running on that. I loaded Ubuntu Workstation. Couldn't get it running on that. So I'm Ubuntu fail all over the place. So just, yeah, yeah start flaming me now. Uh, maybe someone should give me a lesson on uh, getting Minecraft server running on Ubuntu because I, I couldn't get it done. It's, it, it is blasphemy in that community, but I, I've had great luck with Windows 8 and then Hyper-V and then Windows 7 running with it, and it works great. So. Yeah. 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 Very well. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thanks for uh, thanks for giving me an hour of your time. Actually, more than an hour of your time. Thank your family for me and everybody out there uh, listening. Uh, thanks for watching the YouTube. Please go out to thehomeservershow.com/forums. You can get more information. If we didn't answer your question, please head out there. You can get your question answered there. If you're on audio, listening on Stitcher, listening on Blueberry, the Geeks Network, just any podcast player you own, if even if you're listening on iTunes or some kind of iPhone device, head out to iTunes and uh, rate the podcast and give us some stars. That helps us reach other folks and um, download all the other podcasts that are on the Geeks Network, thegeeksnetwork.com. Jim Collison has his uh, the Gadget Geeks, uh, the the Agnostic Tech Podcast guys are doing a great show. They got a brand new episode out there. Uh, a lot about Windows and uh, Windows 10 and Windows devices. So please download all of those. And thank you very much for listening. And we'll see you back here next week. Thanks, guys. Good stuff. And I hear the dogs barking, so my wife's Thanks, home. Yeah, I know. I was like, oh, my God, I hear voices. I got to rap. <laughs> <laughs> see ya. Take care. We'll see you later. Thanks, man. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, guys, in the chat room. Move over to surfacegeeks.net or surfacegeeks.com. I'm going to be talking uh, Surface Geek stuff out there. The chat will still work at homeservershow.com, but the video will not. The video is about the end. If you're on YouTube, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate you downloading and watching. And I know you. a lot of you guys download every week, so I really appreciate that. Our YouTube numbers are just fantastic. So We'll see you next week. Thanks, guys.